one of the largest African-American book fairs on the West Coast. And it is centered in one of the most historic and culturally relevant communities in Los Angeles. That is the beautiful Lemert Park. The Lamert Park Village Book Fair is one of the largest African-American book fairs on the West Coast, and it is centered in one of the most historic and culturally relevant communities in Los Angeles. That is the beautiful Lamert Park. I am honored to say that the very first book I wrote, I had an opportunity to be one of the participants in the Lamert Park Book Fair. This was a self-published book that I wrote over 10 years ago. And I remember being in this tiny little space at the back of the book fair and watching all of those best-selling authors on the stage get to talk about their books and having all of these adoring fans. And I dreamed of one day being one of those authors. And guess what? Last year, I had an opportunity to be the ambassador for the Lamert Park Book Fair. And I was on the main stage with my new book, Awakening. It was such an incredible experience. And because I was the ambassador last year, I got invited back again this year to do one of the best-selling authors' interviews. So this morning, I'm going to share with you my one-on-one -on -one interview with Pulitzer Prize winning Nicole Hannah-Jones. As you know, Miss Hannah Jones is the winning creator of the 1619 Project and a staff writer at the New York Times. This incredible piece of journalism is now the subject of a best-selling book called the 1619 Project. In addition to Miss Jones, there are so many incredible authors who are participating in this year's Summerit Park Book Fair. Tabitha Brown. Another New York Times bestselling author is at the fair. Uh, our favorite, Jennifer Lewis, this year she has the title of Lamert Park Book Fair Ambassador. She has an amazing career in movies and television, and she's out with a memoir. And if you don't know Jennifer Lewis, you should run, not walk, to pick up her book. She happens to be also a native of St. Louis, so I consider her like auntie. Jennifer, I love her. Uh, there's also a tribute this year to the incredible Sidney Poitier. Uh, we know he passed his book, The Measure of a Man, a spiritual autobiography is featured in the book fair. And I could go on and on and on with the incredible authors that are participating. Uh, but make sure you go to the Merck Park Book Fair website. You can view all of the authors' interviews. You can purchase books online. You can feel this, uh, the, the vitality and the energy of the historic Lamert Park. I'm super excited, though, that I had a chance to sit down with Nicole Hannah-Jones. She is such, just an incredible journalist and author. I think you're going to love my interview about her new book, The 1619 Project. Live from Los Angeles, this Special report with Ariva Martin. I'm Ariva Martin. I'm an author, a civil rights attorney, CNN legal analyst, and host of Ariva Martin Out Loud on KBLA Talk 1580. And once again, I am so excited to be a part of the special virtual event of the 15th annual Emert Park Book Fair an event that has promoted literacy and love of reading in the African-American community for over a decade. We have a very special conversation for you today with an amazing author and thought leader who exemplifies Black girl magic. That is Nicole Hannah-Jones. You all know her. 
She is a Pulitzer Prize winning creator of the 1619 Project and a staff writer at the New York Times Magazine. As you know, the 1619 Project helps to explain not only the persistence of anti-Black racism and inequality in America life today, but its roots and what makes this country unique. As a follow-up to the book, 1619 Project, A New Origin Story, Nicole continues the conversation as a definitive account of how racism and Black resistance have shaped this nation. Now, see, Nicole has spent her career investigating racial inequality and injustice, and her reporting has earned her many, many, many awards, including a MacArthur Fellowship. She was also named one of the most influential people in 2021 by Time Magazine. Currently, Nicole is the Knight Chair in Race and Journalism at Howard University, where she has founded the Center for Journalism and Democracy. I am so pleased to welcome the Black Girl Magic of Nicole Hannah-Jones to the 15th Annual Lamert Park Village Book Fair. Hello, how are you? Thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm just excited to be in conversation. This is such an important book fair and such an important community. So I'm looking forward to it. Well, uh, Nicole, I don't think there's anyone that has not heard about the 1619 Project. And I hope there's not anyone that hasn't gotten a copy already of your book, but of course they will be available during the Lamert Park Village Book Fair. And this is such an honor for me because last year I had the privilege of having uh, the fourth book that I've written be featured at the book fair. So I know how important this book fair is to the Los Angeles community and really to the nation because now with this virtual format, people all over the country will have an opportunity to tune in and learn about you and the 1619 Project. So I wanna start first with just your inspiration. What was your inspiration for this incredible piece of groundbreaking work? Uh, my inspiration for this work was really um, two things. One, I, I came across the date 1619 when I was a high school student in a one semester black studies uh, class that was taught actually by a, a man named Ray Dow who's from California. And it was in a book he gave me by Lerone Bennett that I came across that date. And that was such a powerful date for me. One, because I had never heard of uh, the year 1619. No one had ever taught us about the white lion or, uh, you know, that African people had been here longer than um, the pilgrims on the Mayflower. And also it, it really stood in for uh, an erasure, an erasure of black lineage and, and how um, it, it helped me understand that people were choosing what we would learn that what we were taught was all, not all that could be taught, but people had made selections. And so fast forward uh, a few years since I was in high school and um, the 400th anniversary of 1619 was approaching in 2019. I was no longer a high school student, but a journalist at the New York Times. And I really wanted to use that 400th anniversary to um, force a reckoning with the fact that slavery is one of the oldest American institutions and that so much about modern American life, not just, you know, the 1619 Project is not just about what happened a long time ago, but it's about the way that slavery has shaped so much of the society that we live in today. So that was really the inspiration behind the project. Oftentimes, Nicole, we see people in our society that want to take projects like the 1619 Project, books like this book, and the teaching of African American history and make it the other. How is it that the 1619 Project and your work is really a story about all of America? Absolutely. So part of the reason the 1619 Project had to exist is we we treat our history as segregated, right? There's there's history, which is about what white people did. And then we have hyphenated histories, African-American history, Latino history, Asian history, as if these are not all part of, of one intertwined story of America. And so what this project tries to do is really to assert you can't understand America if you don't understand Black people's role in building this country, and that you can't actually separate those histories. They have to be told as a single cohesive history because so much about our society was either around slavery, anti-Blackness, 
or Black resistance to slavery and Black determination to create an actual multiracial democracy. So it really is about showing that these legacies of slavery, they're not just impacting Black people, they're impacting everyone in our society. This is one history that needs to be told. And, you know, it's so interesting that given the history of African-Americans in this country, the fact that the uh, transatlantic slave trade of 15 million people, I mean, a huge number of people is the largest forced migration in the history of the world, you know, reshaped the uh, Atlantic and transformed the global economy. Yet, despite that history, there are still so many people that want to deny and distort the facts that that America is really built on the backs of black people. How is it that people can maintain that position given the significance of, you know, those 50 mil- million people who were in, in this forced migration? I think that's always troubling to people. Like, how can you just resist these obvious facts? Well, uh, what I would argue is that uh, our nation and particularly those in power have engaged in a centuries long propaganda campaign. You know, it is deeply uh, uh, troubling to at once want to believe that you are an exceptional nation founded on these ideals of God given liberty, that we we are the freest uh, country in the, in the history of the world, and then also grapple with how did a country that um, had a, you know, founders who write, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by the creator with inalien- inalienable rights. How do those men hold one fifth of the population in bondage at the time that they wrote those words. So what we tend to do, of course, um, is really uphold the glorious parts of our history and try to erase or marginalize um, the more ugly parts of our history. And so many of us have been taught to believe that, yes, we all know that slavery occurred in the United States, but that it was kind of inconsequential, that it was just a few backwards, you know, white men in the South, and it didn't have any larger impact on our society or our economy or our politics or our legal system. But that's just defied by the actual historic record and by facts. So it really is about us being unable to grapple truthfully with what we are, which is that, as the historian Edmund Morgan said, in America, slavery and freedom um, were created on the same day at the same time. And we have always had these two kind of polar polarizing uh, ideals and realities in America. So when you think about, Nicole, you having taken the time and, and, you know, delved deeply into the history of slavery and its relationship to this country, when you see states trying to enact legislation to change the way slavery is taught, to even, uh, you know, do away with the word slavery, to rewrite that history, to talk about slaves as as if they were somehow uh, immigrants to equate them in the same way that we may see, you know, immigrants coming uh, across the border uh, in places like Texas or Florida. How does that make you feel as a historian? Because if, if these legislators had their way, we would not be talking about slavery in the way that you talk about it in the 1619 project. Absolutely, Areva. What we know is that our history has always been politicized, right? There, our history has always been contested. Um, if you go all the way back to the lost cause narratives after slavery that tried to make the South seem like a benign, uh, genteel part of the country, um, that slavery, you know, wasn't that bad, that that they treated us well, um, that this has always been something that has been deeply politicized. And in our country, when we have moments of demographic anxiety, when we have moments of extreme political polarizations, one of the first things that um, conservatives do is try to prohibit the teaching of our histories and our stories and to really try to ignite what they're calling culture wars, um, to ban books, to to ban curriculums, or to do as you're talking about, as they try to do in Texas, is is to uh, create lies of omission, right, to to obscure uh, the the facts of our history. So we shouldn't be surprised that this is happening, but we should be deeply troubled by it. Because whenever you see uh, PEN America, which is a a group that tracks free speech and, and infringements on free speech, says that we are seeing more efforts to ban and restrict books uh, and ideas than we've seen in at least 40 years. And what that means is that that is a sign of a democracy that is struggling, right? And a democracy that is eroding because healthy societies don't ban books. And what I always say is it's, it's, it's fine if you don't like the 1619 Project. It's fine if you don't agree with the 1619 Project. There are any number of texts that I don't agree with or that I don't like. 
But what is not okay is when you use the power of the state the, to then try to prohibit the teaching of ideas and texts that you don't like. And we should all be opposed to that, no matter where we stand on any of these texts that are being challenged. And it's not you know, incidental that almost all the texts that are being challenged deal with marginalized people. They deal with black people. They deal with other people of color. They deal with trans children, LGBT community. Um, this targeting of marginalized groups, uh, particularly in the classroom, uh, is what people, uh, conservatives do when they are trying to implement uh, authoritarian policies. And, and we see it, uh, Nicole, this effort, some are overt efforts like you, you identified in Texas, but we also see some states trying to lump everything about black history under this, you know, this critical race theory mantra and then rail against uh, schools teaching critical race theory. And as a lawyer that was at Harvard with uh, Professor Derek Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw, you know, I know, uh, like most folks, that critical race theory has never been taught uh, in elementary school, in high school, that it is a, a, you know, a concept and classes that are taught mostly in legal uh, settings, law schools, other graduate level uh, courses. But yet, you know, what do you make of this effort now to turn everything that's about black history into a CRT issue and then say we've got to pass legislation to ban or prohibit the teaching of CRT that's not being taught already in schools? So it, it's such a distortion and yeah. uh, gaslighting of communities, but yet it's taking root in cities and some counties across this country. Absolutely. I mean, what you're talking about is an intentional propaganda campaign, and we need to call it exactly what it is. Uh, one, what they're describing as critical race theory, as you noted, is not actually critical race theory. What they're calling critical race theory is the teaching of any concepts that they think make them uncomfortable. And by then, they mean white children or white adults uncomfortable. Uh, they're lumping in, you know, they're, they're saying that critical race theory is about teachers, teaching white children that they are the oppressor and black children that they are the victim when literally, as you know, critical race theory is about structural inequality. It doesn't actually concern itself with individual racism, but talks about the racism that is structured into our society. And frankly, I would be impressed and approved if schools were teaching critical race theory, because that would mean that they're having highly sophisticated conversations with their children about how a country that was built on a racial architecture uh, continues uh, to see that architecture in the systems, the larger systems and structures of our society. That's a sophisticated way of talking about race. Um, our teaching force is 80% white women. None of us believe that all of these white women are teaching white children that they are racist and they're the oppressor. So we know that this was uh, propaganda, but propaganda can be highly successful. So the fact that we're all talking about critical race theory, the fact that they are using these lies about what critical race theory is uh, to pass legislation, to make it hard for teachers to talk about racism, racial inequality. Again, they're lumping any texts about LGBTQ children, all of these texts of concepts that they just don't want children to learn. They're lumping it under this banner. And it's very hard to fight propaganda with truth, right? Because propaganda is necessarily simple. It is emotional. It carries easy. And the truth is much more complex and nuanced. So we shouldn't even call it critical race theory. I call these laws anti-history laws, anti-memory laws, um, or memory laws, but they're not actually a uh, critical race theory, as you know. Yeah. You know, and it's so frustrating, obviously, because we know so many of these people who are putting forth these laws have no idea themselves what critical race theory That's is. Right. They've never they don't been taught need to. it. They've and I never engaged in a conversation with a professor like yourself yeah. or you know a law school professor about critical race theory. It's you know been uh, put into the popular culture to create these culture wars. You're very purposely done. We know the the white man who you know set out on this mission to do so to popularize the term yes. and to use it as a way to to drive a wedge between uh, conservatives and liberals and blacks and whites. And in some places, he's being very successful. But we know there's something called radical resistance, you know, radical black resistance. You talk a lot about it in the book, the radical resistance of slaves. But but talk about how we're seeing some of that radical resistance play out in today's society, because it, it's not slavery that we're fighting against. But we are fighting against these efforts to erase black history, to erase black culture and to minimize the ongoing racist attacks that are being made on black people and black communities 
uh, every day in this country. Absolutely. One thing we understand as Black people is that there will always be a struggle, right? As, as Credit Scott King said, freedom must be won and rewon by every generation. And so what we're seeing, we have seen before, um, and even though it's exhausting that we have to keep fighting, what choice do we have? So as we speak, uh, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, right, one of the one of the innovators of critical race theory, is on a banned book tour. She's going into communities and giving out uh, free books, um, free books that are on the banned book list, including the 1619 Project and the Children's Book Born in the Water. I've launched a banned book tour where I'm going directly into those states like Tech, Texas, Oklahoma, Florida, Georgia, uh, that are seeking to ban the 1619 Project and showing my support for educators and librarians that are really facing. Um, threats of violence, uh, closure of libraries, right, uh, actually legal prosecution in some places, uh, they're being fired. They really need our support. So what we, what we have to do as people, no matter what your race is, is we cannot allow legislatures and legislators uh, to legislate in our name these regressive policies that we don't agree with. The opposition is extremely organized. Uh, I'm not going to mention that man's name um, who led this That's entire why I called him man. campaign. <laughs> exactly. Because uh, I'm not giving him any any free advertising. But he was explicit. This was an orchestrated campaign. And there's all this money and all this organizing that's leading to these book bans. And those of us who believe in true freedom of speech, who believe in treating all people with respect, who believe that learning about communities that are different from yours and ideas that are different from yours build tolerance, we have not been nearly as organized. But I think many of us are waking up and realizing we have to get out there and fight just as hard as those who want to pass these regressive laws in our name. Um, and, and that's what we have done, right? I, I talk about, you know, of all the, the contention over the 1619 Project, what I think so much of it is really about is that I place Black Americans as the primary democratizing force in this country, that we have been the most ardent freedom fighters this country has ever seen. And I try to really subvert this narrative of who our founding fathers were. Um, the men we call our founding fathers had these lofty ideals, but they didn't actually believe in them. And they certainly didn't believe in them for people like us. But black people uh, saw those ideas and fought to make them true. So we will continue to play that role in this country. Uh, we, we don't have a choice. Um, and I think, as you said, radical black, re radical black resistance has been what we have done since 1619 uh, when we stepped off the white line and what we will continue to do now. What do you say, Nicole, to those people at home who are listening to this, watching this, who aren't going to be able to go on these book tours, who, who are not going to be able to go into these states like Texas and Florida and Georgia uh, and raise their voices in a way, obviously, that someone like you and Kimberly Crenshaw right. and other uh, authors and educators can do. What can everyday people do who maybe they're facing this at their kid's school or their grandkids' school or maybe even on their jobs? You know, they're facing people who are resisting this notion that there is institutional racism and, you know, resisting the concepts in this book about the relationship of slavery in this country and how uh, the impact of slavery still permeates pretty much every institution in this country today. What advice do you have for them? Absolutely. I mean, we all have a role to play. I have a big platform, so I try to use uh, the megaphone of my platform. But a regular person can go to that school board meeting when these oppositions, uh, when these other groups are coming and, and trying to get uh, these laws passed or books taken off the shelves. You know, you can go to that school board meeting. You can send your teachers a letter of support. It goes a long way. I can tell as someone who's been attacked quite a bit, um, it goes a long way when you open your email and everything in there is not an attack on you, but there's a letter in there saying, I appreciate what you're doing. We support you. You know, you can write your legislatures and say, you know, I oppose these types of bills. These bills should not be happening in a free society. Um, you can donate books to places that are having a difficult time getting those books. And many of us have worked with black bookstores in states that have these book bans and are just purchasing books and telling people go in and, and get this book for free because it, you can't get it at your school anymore. So there's many things that we as individuals can do. And what I hope people will take 
uh, if you read the 1619 Project, if you understand our history, is that none of us are powerless. If people who had, you know, our enslaved ancestors had no recognized rights in our society, and yet they found ways big and small to resist, whether they were breaking tools or running away or poisoning the master, right? There's a scale. There's a scale <laughs> to how we can resist. And e each and every one of us has a power uh, to enact some sort of change. Yeah, I like that you say everybody has the power to do something. You don't have to be Harriet Tubman. That's you right. You have to lead slaves, you know, away from the South. But there is something that everyone can do. I interviewed a teacher who did exactly what you're talking about doing. He started buying books and leaving them at local coffee shops in his Florida community, telling his students, you know, don't buy that coffee shop. Yeah. You know, there's something there for you. And giving the students in his class an opportunity to pick those books up away from the school so he wasn't violating that's any right. of the school's, uh, you know, regulations and, and prohibitions, but he was giving students an opportunity to pick up books like The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison, That's which right. has been banned in many of these states that we're talking about. Uh, but you talk about attacks and your book, The 1619, or the project that was, uh, you know, that came out, came out during the Trump era. Yes. And, and I can recall the vicious and vile attacks and, and I'm watching them from afar. So you're living these attacks, like you said, you know, emails and social media attacks and pundits on television. Uh, I can only imagine, you know, what your inbox look like on your computer. But uh, tell us, how did you deal with that? Because, you know, a lot of people have gone off social media. I'm thinking of Leslie Jones, you know, she was attacked so, uh, you know, uh, it, the attacks were so uh, ferocious and, and that she actually shut down her Twitter account yeah. at one point. How did you deal with the, just the vile attacks from those on the right, including people in the highest office in this land. Yeah, you know, it, it depended on the day, honestly. You know, it's easy to say, oh, it didn't bother me or, but it did, right? It, 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 it can be frightening when the president of the United States is attacking you. Um, it can be um, just exhausting, just the, the amount of attacks and, and people saying things um, that have no truth whatsoever. Uh, you know, I, I, I didn't get into journalism to become a public figure, but I, I've somehow become this symbol, either a symbol that people love or a symbol that people hate. Um, but three years after the 1619 Project, I really have come to this place of Zen. Uh, I'm not off social media, but I engage uh, very infrequently on social media. I don't argue with people anymore because what I've realized, and, and, and a very good friend of me told, told me this, is that Nicole, you're winning, right? Like the fact that they keep attacking you, the fact that they can't keep, stop bringing your name up, they can't stop bringing the 1619 Project up, it means that they are afraid of this project, right? Um, and they cannot take away what this project means to your community. And the only person who can do that is you, right? So I'm the only one that can discredit my work and how I respond and how I behave. And so I've really learned to, um, to take it as a badge of honor that so many powerful people would try to attack this project. I didn't become a journalist to make powerful people comfortable. You can't tell an honest story about slavery and anti-black racism and not make powerful people upset. If powerful people, if powerful people love this project, this project would have been a failure. So uh, I'm all good right now. I, I've learned to deal well with it and to take it as one of the greatest compliments of my career that you could do work write a work of journalism that has conservative politicians so afraid that they, they literally want to ban it by law. Well, one of my uh, favorite quotes from one of my girl crushes who happens to be Lizzo, uh, this is her response, this is her, her clap back to a critique from our good friend Kanye West. She says, I'm mining my fat, black, beautiful <laughs> business. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, she's famous for screaming out the B word that I will say right. and saying that she's winning. So I'm glad to hear that you also are at that place of Zen where you are embracing the fact that you are mining your beautiful black business and that you are also <laughs> winning in the words of Lizzo. I, I do want to ask you before I let you go, though, about racial progress, because I think that's what's making the folks on the right, the conservatives, the MAGA crowd so nervous is this notion that we could make racial progress in this country. Now, there is the myth of racial progress yeah. that was you know, promulgated and disseminated when Obama was elected in 2008, and we were in this alleged post-racial yeah. period in our country. So I'm not talking about that, you know, that uh, gaslighting that, that took place after Obama's election, but I'm talking about real 
racial progress. And, and I, I don't know if you know Lady Hubbard. She uh, is a fiction writer. She wrote a book just out too called The Last Suspicious Holdout. And it's about black couples of black people in this mythical suburban area grappling with this notion of what racial progress really is. So when you think about racial progress, you know, how would you define where we are in this moment? Hmm. You know, um, the second to the last essay in the 1619 book is an essay by uh, Ibram X. Kendi called Progress. And it talks about how in, in this society we we really are obsessed with this notion of progress and that we're always moving forward. We're always becoming a better society. So, you know, things were bad a long time ago um, and things aren't great now, but they're going to get better in the future because progress is inevitable. But what he argues is that we have moments of racial progress and then we have moments of racist progress. And we are clearly in a period of racist progress, right? Where the gains that we thought we made under a first black president, the gains that black people um, were starting to make in things like home ownership, um, that that was seen, or even symbolic gains, like um, taking certain political positions that we had never been in before, that for many people in this country, that was not a sign of progress. And so you follow the first black president with an openly white nationalist president, and now a political party that no longer believes in democracy, if democracy means sharing power with people of color. So I think we're actually in a period of um, racist progress where, yes, there are individual black people who are achieving great things, but the circumstance for most black people is not gotten any better. And in fact, um, our political rights are being eroded. And we have to always uh, be vigilant about these periods where if we think everything will be OK, it necessarily won't be. <laughs> And uh, we're going to decide what country we're going to be. I think at this next midterm, um, a lot will be determined about the state of our democracy. And as the most vulnerable citizens in our democracy, uh, Black Americans, of course, have the most to lose. Yeah, I, I love that concept of racist progress. I don't know if you've been tracking the story that's happening in Los Angeles where these three Latino city council members yes. are recorded, caught on audio tape making you know, the most vile racist comments, uh, including comments about a little black child, referring to that child as a monkey and talking about white members of the council as being with the blacks and calling our white district attorney, you know, as being like the blacks. And, and for a lot of people, they're grappling with what was supposed to be this coalition between black and brown people. What impact do you think this period where we had Donald Trump in office and the rise of, of not the, the, you know, we know white nationalists and white supremacists existed way before Donald Trump, but the way they became so emboldened, started saying right. the quiet part out loud. What impact do you think that had on even the Latinx community in, in terms of, of their, you know, freedom, willingness, openness about repeating some of these vile racist tropes uh, and just the, the concept that white supremacy is not just limited to white people. Well, absolutely. Well, so this, this is an entire lecture in and of itself. And I think part of why we, we struggle um, to understand how there can be anti-blackness amongst Latinos or, you know, because we group all people of color together uh, is because we have a really lack of sophistication of understanding how racial categories work, right? So Latino is not a race. Um, Latinos can be white. The majority of Latinos in the United States self-identify as white. Uh, Anti-blackness, of course, is rife across Latin America. Latin America engaged in African slavery. Mexico had slavery, um, go, you know, the Dominican Republic, Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, Ecuador, Panama, Peru, like name them. They all engaged in African slavery. So, of course, anti-blackness exists in the Latino population. Just because you are not uh, seen as white, white in America doesn't mean that you can't also be anti-black. And there is a long history of that. So we, we get shocked by this because we like to group all people who are not white together. Um, but you can have black Latinos, Asian Latinos, white Latinos. And you have long seen uh, this political divide amongst Latinos where a significant number of Latinos 
have supported Republican candidates, uh, have been primed to Donald Trump's message, supported Republicans before Donald Trump. We like to kind of lump them into one racial group like we do with black people, but you can't actually do that with Latinos. So frankly, I'm not surprised um, when any group of people exhibits anti-blackness. Anti-blackness is endemic in the United States. It is in the air that we breathe. Um, you actually are quite exceptional in this country if you are not anti-black. So we shouldn't be shocked by this. We really have to be much more sophisticated in our racial analysis. Now, I do have to add, there is a lot of black and brown unity. Uh, there have been people who have worked on this for, uh, you know, decades. And even amongst the Latino community, you have many people who support Black Lives Matter and Black liberation. So what I'm saying is we have to stop thinking of this group as monolithic and understand that this is a very diverse group with very different experiences, um, who come from very different types of countries and communities. And so, yes, every, every diversity you'll see in any community, you will also see there. And that includes anti-Blackness. And just final thought, reparations. I know mm -hmm. that uh, you believe, I've, I've read, that you feel that reparations is the answer, one way of, of righting the wrongs of slavery. California uh, passed a piece of legislation to study reparations. There's been a commission that's been going to, uh, around the state taking testimony. They've come out with a 500-page report, preliminary report. Uh, how hopeful are you that we will get to reparations in this country, whether it's through this California commission that may lead on it, uh, whether you look at examples that are happening in places like Evanston, Illinois, uh, you know, the, what's happening at the federal level around reparations. Are, are you hopeful that in your lifetime, in my lifetime, in our lifetime, we are going to see some big state like California or our federal government actually uh, go beyond making an apology for slavery and actually uh, do restorative justice, reparative justice uh, around the issue of slavery. So as you know, the, the last chapter in the book is uh, a chapter I wrote called Justice, and it makes the case for reparations, not just for slavery, but for the 100 years of legal apartheid uh, in this country, which is what uh, California's reparations bill is not addressing slavery, of course, because while there was enslavement in California, California was technically a free state, but what California did do is uh, implement an entire architecture of racial apartheid, and, and that is really what the California bill is about. So... This is what I'll say. I, I don't tend to be a hopeful person when it comes to race at all. Uh, black people have been fighting for reparations since the time of slavery, after slavery, and now. And we are um, the one group that has not received reparations, even though uh, slavery lasted longer than, than any of these other um, harms, except, of course, what happened to indigenous people. Um, so I don't know that I, I don't feel hope. What I do feel is that we are as close as we've ever been to getting reparations, um, that we are seeing it implemented at the local level, at the individual level, when the beach was given back to the black family and taken seriously at the state level and the federal level. In my lifetime, reparation has never been taken as a serious political issue. It's been seen as fringe and marginal, and that's just not the case anymore. So I won't try to predict the future, but what I will say is, that's what I'm working towards. That's what so many others are working towards. And if there ever was a chance, uh, we are the closest that we, as we've ever come. Well, I am speaking with Nicole Hannah-Jones. She is the author of the 1619 Project. This is a must read for everyone. She is kicking off the Lamert Park Village Book Fair. And we are so excited to have her this year as our featured author. If you have not read this book, you must read it. And you must uh, follow... Nicole on all social media platforms. Just follow the great work she is doing. We are so grateful to have been able to spend this time with you. And we know great things are going to continue to follow you and keep fighting that fight for reparations. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful <laughs> that California is going to do something. We're not going to let little bitty Evanston uh, outdo us. We're, we're going to show this nation uh, how to do restorative and reparative justice. And, and I'm super excited about that. And uh, hopefully we'll have you back at the book fair as we're celebrating yes. what reparations can look like for this entire country. But again, thank you Absolutely. for sitting down with me today. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining. Oh my God. I am not typically a fangirl, but if you know me well, you know, I love Lizzo.
now I'm going to have to say, move over, Lizzo. Because I got to add Nicole Hannah Jones to my list of women that I admire and adore. I think she is incredible. I think her body of work is so incredibly important in this moment of history that we find ourselves in, particularly coming out of the midterm elections, particularly given that Donald Trump has announced that he's running for president again, we can expect to see some of the lies, some of the myths, some of the misinformation about the history of African-Americans in the United States. Uh, We can expect to see those amplified and, and resurfaced in so many different places and spaces. But thank goodness Nicole Hannah-Jones has set the record straight and has given us a definitive history on the transatlantic slave trade and the history of African-Americans in the United States. So kudos to Nicole Hannah-Jones. If you don't have the book, run out and buy it immediately. Go to Malik Bookstores, who is the official bookseller for the Lamert Park Book Fair. And as I said at the beginning, please check out the other authors. This year's book fair was incredible and it's all online. So you can watch it anywhere. You can watch it in St. Louis. You can watch it in New York, Chicago. It doesn't matter where you are. You get to enjoy these incredible authors. Uh, My words to live by before I get out. Knowledge is power. And when you check out the Lamert Park book fair, you are going to gain so much knowledge and you are going to feel so powerful. Be safe out there. Remember, we're all in this together.